Good afternoon and welcome back to another Research in Action brought to you by the Division of Research at Florida Atlantic University. And with that, it is my great pleasure to introduce today's speaker. Uh, you may know her if you have uh, participated in one of our previous uh, webinars. Uh, Dr. Lisa Wiese is an associate professor in our College of Nursing. And uh, her primary fo research focus is on rural communities, which was not the topic of her last uh, presentation, which she uh, shared with two of our students. Today, she will talk on this topic, though. Dr. Luisi is a recipient of uh, substantial amounts of funding and also has uh, several dozens of publications on this topic. And with that, I'm just going to turn it over to Dr. Luisi and let her talk uh, tell you about her research interests. Hi everyone, welcome. Just loading my computer uh, slideshow here. Okay, well, I really appreciate you all being here. It's such a busy time of year. Uh, you know, it's tough to, um, to do things. It's tough to, to attend anything at this time of year. It's, it's such a busy time of year. So I really appreciate you all, um, you know, taking time out to come. And I look forward, uh, hopefully, some uh, good questions that you might have for me. Uh, but without further ado, let's talk about aging in rural communities. The advocacy does matter. Um, I first presented this uh, last month at the Gerontological Society of America annual scientific conference. Uh, it was a virtual podium presentation with my esteemed colleague, Dr. Ashan Williams. From, she is assistant dean for diversity and inclusion at the School of Nursing at the University of Virginia. So I'm um, going to share uh, our findings with you. And um, I wanna start with a little bit of a background. Um, this uh, work shows that um, Whedon and colleagues highlighted the disparity that rural populations face in regards to increased dementia. So just to clarify, when you're looking at the screen, the RRR, uh, that you see here means relative risk ratio. We talk about in terms of reduction or risk. Um, and CIND means cognitive impairment, no dementia. And uh, typically CIND is a term used to designate the period between cognitive status of normal aging and the diagnosis of dementia. And so this table from Wayne's team illustrates that they found nearly an 80% higher risk of dementia in the rural compared to urban settings with a confidence interval of 95%. After controlling for sociodemographic and other health factors such as hypertension, diabetes, stroke, et cetera. And I also wanna point out the note here um, after age 80, how dramatically the risk increases as well. This graph is from another important study uh, in which my Ada and colleagues in 2016 highlighted the increased projection of dementia incidence among Blacks, American Indian, Alaska Natives, and Latinos between ages 65 and 90. So um, the, much of my talk is going to focus on the fact that we have multiple disparities going on in rural populations that are ethnically diverse. And to that end, I decided I wanted to try to create some kind of a, a graph to show this. Um, so you could look here and see under root causes, I tried to uh, categorize them by rural and ethnically diverse. So on the rural side are lack of trained and will pro willing providers, less years of education, lower health literacy, increased chronic illness, obesity, people who are underinsured, or smoke more and um, our older age. And of course, some of those overlap with the ethnically diverse root causes, also less years of education, lower health literacy, increased chronic illness, poor nutrition, and provider hesitancy to diagnose or lack of knowledge regarding benefits of early detection. So when you think about this, what, what continues to fuel these disparities? We're all more familiar with the root causes due to the latest science revealing that life course factors are of major importance in brain health over time. It is essential to consider geography and culture. For example, this slide illustrates how persons who are both rural and ethnically diverse have an even higher risk of dementia, two to four times. Many of the root causes leading to cognitive decline that are shown here are shared between these groups, as I mentioned. Furthermore, health equity and other disparities also stem 
from racial inequalities in healthcare, which is now referred to as racism in healthcare. This systemic issue could potentially influence the way in which providers engage or don't engage with their patients. Underlying these root causes, I believe, is a lack of health equity, such as less access to health care and health education and willing providers. For example, uh, we've heard many times that even if providers are accessible, many don't want to venture down the road of sharing a dementia diagnosis because they believe that rural residents don't want to be informed or they feel like nothing can be done, or they don't have the time to do anything, uh, the providers. So our purpose uh, of our work was to examine what rural ethnically diverse persons in very rural settings knew and perceived about Alzheimer's disease and other dementias, and if they would be willing to be screened for potential memory loss. And of course, we also wanted to look at potential predictors and covariates of the findings. The short-term goal was to inform the development of educational interventions to address misperceptions and knowledge gaps about different types of dementias among lay residents and providers, and also highlight the importance of early dementia detection. The long-term goal is to improve rates of dementia detection and management in underserved settings. And you can see here, these are pictures from six different sites that uh, where we conducted our work. Um, Southern West Virginia, Belglade, Florida, North Carolina, Alabama and Limestone County, Virginia, uh, two sites and in the Panhandle, West Virginia, which is my home state. So we conducted a descriptive correlational study of different convenience samples uh, in those areas I just highlighted of persons age 16 or older over three years for a total sample size of 580. In addition to their routine demographics and uh, several surveys, we asked participants if they had been offered prior memory tests by a provider and if they would like to participate in immediate memory screening. So these were the surveys we used, the PRISM PC stands for uh, Perceptions Regarding Investigational Screening for Memory and Primary Care. This is Bistani and colleagues uh, Likert scale measured, ask questions about perceived benefits and harms of dementia screening. The BCAD uh, or Basic Knowledge of Alzheimer's Disease Survey is a novel measure we designed to meet the need for a dementia knowledge survey that is appropriate for underserved populations. The realm or Rapid Estimate of Health Literacy and Medicine short form uh, was created by Arizula and colleagues in 2007. It's a health literacy measure that's comprised of eight words, uh, including jaundice, anemia, and exercise. The MINICOG is Borson's five-minute cognitive assessment that involves short-term recall of three words and a clock drawing test. So the BCAT was administered to all of the participants. V and the MINICOG were administered only to the Florida participants with an N of 287. All our measures were translated using a professional translation service to Spanish and Haitian Creole so that we could administer them in the um, Western Palm Beach County rural area. Total scores and sociodemographic lives using the usual frequency statistics, Pearson correlation, chi-square, logistic regression. And we examine covariates of willingness to participate in memory screening. So here you see uh, the sociodemographics. Um, and uh, just to summarize it, 84% of the sample was ethnically diverse and 60% had lived in a area 10 years or longer. Only about 6% of rural residents reported prior memory screening by a provider. And then I pulled out the Florida sample. The average health literacy was very low at a third grade level. Although we found um, and referred uh, almost 20% of persons to their provider due to a Minicog result of less than three, uh, because that's indicative of a need for further cognitive assessment, the majority of participants had not been screened uh, earlier, as I mentioned. The average age of the overall sample was 72 with a standard deviation of nine. Average years of education was 8.7. And years of rural average was 35. So this is a standard deviation of 22. On the BCAD of 32 points possible, the average score was 22. As expected, older age was negatively correlated with years of formal education and health literacy. 
But what was surprising was that the years lived in a rural area did correlate weakly with a higher BCAD score, uh, as shown by Pearson's R of significance of P equals 0 0.01. So we were thinking this might be due to more exposure to dementia in the rural setting. You have older people, you have more incidence of dementia, and of course, uh, families uh, are typically the informal caregivers there. Or they so there might be a lot more experience um, with dementia in, the, in those settings. This slide shows the results from the items addressing screening from the Prison PC survey among the Florida cohort. So these significant findings reveal that rural residents overwhelmingly, like around 95% across all items, indicated that they will want to know if they were at higher risk and they will want to know if they had dementia or a memory problem. And this was collaborated in the sociodemographic surveys where we asked if they would want to participate in screening. And, uh, and in those persons, we did do screening. I'll talk about that in a moment. Furthermore, they indicated that they would participate in memory screening, as I said, and wanted a doctor to examine them every year to know if they had developed Alzheimer's disease. So this, this was really important uh, for us. This slide is showing results from several of the other 35 questions included in the PRISM, which again highlights more, not less, willingness to engage in health-seeking behaviors. For example, between 60 and 70% of persons indicated that they would be willing to have a blood test for Alzheimer's disease. And the, you know, we may assume that because of the injustice of the Tuskegee syphilis trials and the Henrietta Lacks cells exploitation, um, and historical you know, uh, trauma really associated with um, misuse of ethnically diverse cultures and research. Uh, the persons of ethnically diverse backgrounds would oppose uh, research and in particular blood studies. However, we found the opposite in this small but revealing study. We bring your attention to the stakeholder perceptions that most persons would not be ashamed or embarrassed of their uh, being told they had a dementia diagnosis. Um, and they would be willing to be tested. Uh, we had a question uh, in the survey also, would you be willing to undergo a blood test? Uh, you can see here that only uh, basically 10% said no, everybody else that answered the question said yes. And this is important because I don't know if you saw the headlines in the Palm Beach Post paper two days ago, but there was a big headline across that said, you know, blood tests now available for dementia or Alzheimer's disease, I can't remember exactly. But uh, as you know, hopefully you know, Alzheimer's is the most common type of dementia. Um, but anyway, so um, you know, what that test is doing is it's measuring uh, the amount of uh, plasma uh, tau protein in your body, in your blood. If we know that you know, we all have a little bit, but under, over a certain level increases your risk for dementia. So. Uh, we expect that to be available to the public in the next year. So th these kind of findings are important. Um, so why is it important to know um, it early on if you have dementia? S well, now we know there are a lot of things that increase your risk. We know that lack of sleep, um, poor nutrition, uh, lack of exercise, um, smoking, uh, hypertension, diabetes, all those things increase your risk. So if, if someone knows early on that they're already at risk for developing this devastating illness, it's costly and, and just so debilitating and so hard on caregivers, um, then perhaps they might be willing to do some things to change their lifestyle uh, and to do more health-seeking behaviors. Also, you know, there's so uh, many resources being poured into this illness because it is expected to bankrupt Medicare by 2050 if nothing happens or changes the way things are currently going, um, that uh, we feel sure we're going to find uh, a way to at least um, stop progression of the disease. We may not be able to prevent it per se, except through you know, healthy living, but we may be able to stop progression. And that, that's huge. So one thing we know is that medications work better uh, when started earlier in the disease process. So all of these, all of these things are important uh, when you consider that people really do want
Um, so another thing I want to point out is 95% of persons would not give up on life. And this desire to live, it must be at the core of our efforts to improve health justice. So in these areas that have limited health access, have limited education, these people want to be healthy. They want to be informed. They, they just don't know, or they need help, or they, you know, are, are being discarded or disregarded. So um, to me, this is where the issue of health justice really comes into play. So we looked at, um, you know, does ethnicity make a difference? So we, we you know, we looked at um, African-American, Afro-Caribbean, Hispanic American, compared them to whites. And you can see here that it made no difference. So 154 of the sample, this is in Florida, wanted to be screened, 57, you know, out of 63 Afro-Caribbeans wanted to be screened and 175 of the 179 Hispanic Americans wanted to be screened. So, you know, you can see that, um, you know, there's, there's no myth here. You know, these, um, these groups really do want to be, um, you know, informed, at least informed. Um, so the, the next step, you know, after screening is to get their providers on board to see if there are other illnesses uh, that might be accounting for cognitive deficits, uh, to see about their lifestyle, to see if there's medications they can put, uh, you know, the patients on to help because, uh, you know, all dementia is not equal. They have different treatments. Uh, they have different symptoms. They have different treatments. So uh, it's really important to find out if there is a cognitive change, excuse me, if there is a cognitive change and, um, and, um, and then do something about it. So we looked at also at the co covariates such as age, years lived in a rural area, years of formal school and health literacy. Interesting, the only predictor for willing to, willingness to screen was a rural area. So this was in Florida, um, it matched our national or I should say Southeastern um, sample where we went to all these different places. Uh, so there, even though rural uh, communities are different, uh, you know, a rural area in Oklahoma is certainly different than one in Florida uh, and is different from one in, in Northeast Maine. Um, you know, you want, you want to consider these are strong, uh, hardy people who've dealt with a lot of um, challenges through their life, and they're willing to take this on too, in my opinion. So greater number of years lived rurally was the only significant predictor. We talked about that and that ethnicity was not a significant factor. So despite finding, you know, this uh, lower score on the BCAD among most rural settings, 83% uh, were willing to participate in Alzheimer's disease research. 95% of those indicated they would participate in memory screening and over 90% of those invited during the Florida study did participate in memory screening. And um, again, I wanna highlight that although we found 20% of the population were at risk of cognitive decline, less than 5% of those had previous memory And in the overall study, based on the PRISM survey, most uh, rural older adults believed heart disease and poor diet increased Alzheimer's disease and related dementia risk, yet no active health education programs were being offered. And these findings are typical to what you see in the literature. About 20% of people being surveyed in any given group are finding, um, you know, we're finding that they have cognitive decline that has not been diagnosed. So there are some limitations, of course, to this study. Um, uh, you know, this were, these were convenience samples. So persons who agreed to participate were already artificially skewed toward health promotion. Although we do think that the gift cards that we give. Uh, most of the time it was only a $5 gift card, but you know, that's, I, I always found that to be of, of use to our participants. Um, so that might've helped to mildly reduce the threat. Another limitation is that rural cultures are diverse throughout the United States, as I talked about. So it's important, um, you know, you can't generalize these findings to all rural cultures, although we feel like we have a good start of an understanding of a trend but you know you still need to 
assess your own rural community. And persons who are advised to seek follow provider were not followed to determine the extent of additional health seeking action. And so in my current KO1, we are doing that. We're following up to find out uh, you know, if these people took the results to their provider and what happened. And I had done a study funded by the Florida Department of Health where we actually followed up with nurse practitioners who went out and visited persons in their home, conducted an in-depth uh, gerontological screening and uh, you know, wrote it up as a consult and sent it to the provider. And the providers found that to be very helpful. So that's, that's another um, avenue, a way to address um, you know, the lack of follow-up. Another thing is that a screening measure that examines more diverse brain functions, such as the, the uh, MOCA uh, and the MOCA basic, which is geared toward underserved populations, uh, is useful. You know, and that when it addresses executive function, attention, processing speed, and delay recall. So we have planned on using that um, in, in my current study, and then COVID hit. But fortunately, Dr. Nazardine, who, who uh, designed the MOCA, he and his colleagues, uh, in 2019, he actually was able to design and, and pilot test and further test and get good reliability and validity on the telephone uh, version of that MOCA. And it's, um, it has all the components except for the trails test, which is one of the executive function measures and the visual um, you know, which is visual language that pointing out what um, the animals are or the creatures are, depending on which, um, or not creatures, but figures are, um, depending on which version you're using the MOCA or MOCA B. Um, but we have had tremendously good success with using this mini MOCA T. Um, we give it over the phone uh, and it's, it has really helped us identify people at cognitive decline. And we've actually had a 28% um, detection of cognitive change in uh, the residents out in the glade since we started using that. And uh, so I feel, I feel confident that even if we, this pandemic continues for a while, we'll be able to help identify people and get them clear. These are uh, implications. So of course, uh, we don't do anything in a rural community without using a community-based participatory research. And that means engaging your community stakeholders um, to develop uh, the program of research and education. Also, uh, we've been fortunate that we were able to recruit some of our stakeholders to serve as health educators. Uh, this is a screenshot of uh, a meeting that we were having uh, with uh, stakeholders out in the glades. Um, you know, I really want to get to the providers and see how I can partner with them um, to, uh, to make sure that follow-up is happening with the people that we send to them. And research, you know, we, we, we're now doing a, a faith-based approach because uh, our community stakeholders said, if you want to do something out here and really get people that you need to get, you need to work through the churches. So uh, that's what we did. And that's what my KO1 study is. Um, it's based on Schoenberg's model, Faith Moves Mountains, um, which she's been hugely successful in rural Kentucky uh, and has made quite an impact in terms of um, detecting breast and prostate cancer, decreasing diabetes, management of diabetes. Um, now they're working on um, clean lungs and air, which is timely in the time of COVID. Uh, and uh, so we, we've applied her model to um, Alzheimer's disease. And we look to um, expand that that's, um, work to other faith-based settings in rural areas uh, on the other side of Lake O, Lake Okeechobee and uh, beyond in the state of Florida. The other thing that we realized is that there's not a good um, health literacy measure um, and so with Dr. Galvin, uh, who's my primary mentor on my K, to whom I owe a lot of my success, um, uh, he, we, he and I have uh, put in a patent for a dementia literacy assessment. So uh, it's based on a storytelling intervention uh, and we'll be using visuals to, uh, to increase awareness of dementia uh, in rural and other underserved uh, areas. 
So when I reflect on this, um, you know, I feel it's really important to continue to focus on this health justice among rural older adults who face these multiple health disparities. You know, just, just initiating a good faith effort isn't enough. You have to be willing to have a sustained presence out there. Uh, that's really important. Um, and then focusing on community center care, you know, letting your community drive your research uh, and be an integral partner is um, just vital. And that's the end of my talk. So if you have any questions, I'll take them. Thank you, Lisa. I appreciate that. Um, as a reminder, if you have any questions, please uh, hover your mouse in the bottom of your screen. And you, you have a Q&A button there. You can uh, type your question there. And we go through those in the order they're received. Um, Lisa, you mentioned, I think, six sites total that you did these studies in. Did you find the same results in all six? And I may have uh, missed that. Um, but did you find the same results in all six sites? Or did they differ? That's a really good question. The only difference we found among sites was what people knew, like certain items on the BCAD uh, fell out differently. Uh, for example, uh, people in West Virginia and Virginia um, answered the questions correctly much more often regarding uh, if vascular disease, you know, hypertension and diabetes increase risk of Alzheimer's disease over people in Alabama and North Carolina. And, you know, it's, you wonder what's going on there, if it's things that's in the news or, you know, if there's been an effort, you know, there's a couple of those states have much more active Alzheimer's associations than others. So, um, you know, you just wonder what that's about. But the, the main, uh, main area that we saw differences was in their knowledge of the illness. Um, as far as willingness to screen, no difference. We had high percentages, 90% and above in every single that we screen. And the uh, difference in health literacy, could that be traced back to access to information? Were you able to trace that back to any you know, access? Oh, that's a good question. I've forgotten about the difference in health literacy. Yeah, that was very distinctive. Um, pretty much it was the same around, uh, uh, we had, we, well, let's see. Um, in, in West Virginia and Virginia and um, Northern Florida, we had about 11th grade health literacy level, which is pretty high. Um, so in North Carolina, Alabama, it ranged between eight and 10%. And then what you're referring to that big gap uh, in health literacy in our uh, Florida rural population in Palm Beach County. Most of the people that we work with out there, they are retired migrant or farm workers. And so uh, English is not their first language. Mm -hmm. And they didn't go to school. You know, they they uh, either came here as a young adult or they were raised here and, you know, they didn't go to school much beyond first, second, third grade. I mean, we had probably 10 percent of our population out there had not had more than a third grade education. So it kind of makes sense that their health literacy was so low. We had we had a handful of people who, who reported You're fading out a little bit. <laughs> no education out of that sample. Great. Um, you talked a lot about um, memory testing. Can you go into a little bit more into detail and what actually uh, a, like a memory test in, involves and what you're testing for in these tests? Sure. So um, in, in this research, uh, we had used the MINICOG, which is a, a very well-known, widely used measure um, you give three words. I use daughter, heaven, and mountain. Uh, you would have the people repeat it back to you uh, twice. And then you would give them a, a task to do, which was a clock drawing test, where they had to draw the old fashioned clock with a circle and put the numbers around the face of the clock and then draw in the time, like 1120, whatever you gave them. Um, so, you know, it addressed a few different areas of executive function. Um, but the MOCA, um, as I talked about, goes into um, aspects of cognitive testing. Uh, you have, uh, usually you have the visual where they have to uh, recall word naming and name the animals they see. 
They have to do um, visual, which is recognizing objects. Uh, they have to uh, do the recall, of course, the three words and the clock drawing test, and also test, which is a really good test of executive function, where you have to go 1A, 2B, 3C. You have to alternate the uh, numbers and letters and connect. Uh, so on the mini mocha, uh, we had the, the um, word uh, recall, um, and then they had a task where in one minute they have to name as many words as they can with the letter T, and then the number of words uh, determines what score they get for that area. And then we do orientation, uh, which is, you know, date, day, time, place, location, that kind of thing. And then we ask for the three word recall again. And uh, so we have found that to be very helpful because it addresses short term memory loss. It addresses executive function because they have to recall words. And, 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 and that's really interesting because you're sitting there and you're thinking there's so many words with T, you know, uh, but you really have to concentrate. And yeah, so. Uh, so yeah, that's, but that's probably not that easy. <laughs> right, right, exactly. So, you know, and to get full points on that, they have to come up with at least nine words in one minute. And um, it's, it's really a challenge for people. So it's been effective to use that. Yeah, yeah. and there are many others I really like, um, especially caregivers on board, although uh, they just released the article person itself can do it. It's a functional assessment. It's called the Quick Dementia Rating Scale, the QDRS by Jim Galvin. Um, and it's really nice because it doesn't ask anyone to do anything. You know, you're not, you wouldn't be stressing someone out by asking them to remember three words or whatever. It's observation of function. So, you know, are they getting dressed by themselves? Are they having trouble remembering where to go? Are they able to, to um, navigate, you know, paying a bill and, and you know, all kinds of things. Um, and it's not too long. It's fairly easy. A caregiver can fill it out. And it's a really, um, it's, it's really useful for also uh, delineating what types of dementia a person has based on the uh, types of errors that they have on this on the scale. That's very interesting because not everybody has Alzheimer's who has dementia, right? Right, uh, exactly. So everybody who has Alzheimer's has dementia, but not everybody who has dementia has Alzheimer's. Correct. Yeah. Our top three are Alzheimer's, Lewy body, and vascular. Some people will say, depending on what area of the country you live in, that vascular dementia is uh, more common than Lewy body. But the important thing is they are all treated differently. So that's why you need to be evaluated by a neurologist or a neuropsych nurse practitioner. At our center at FAU, we have tremendous uh, skilled, trained staff, nurses, uh, nurse practitioners there who you know will um, really pin down what kind of cognitive um, issues are going on with someone and get them help. Very interesting. And it's actually a related uh, question here. So not everyone can pass the test that you just mentioned, uh, especially if that person is illiterate. And the question here is, can you can you distinguish between somebody who has Alzheimer's and doesn't pass the test, or they're not test they're not passing the test because he or she is illiterate? Yes. Yeah, so the nice thing about the mini mocha is you can you can just talk to them all in their language. So if they can speak it, they can do it. So, uh, you know, they, you can give them three words in their language to recall. You can ask them to say nine words in their, uh, you know, the start with the letter T and that. You can ask them to, to state where are they, what are they doing, that kind of thing. They don't have to read any of this. This is all oral. That's why we're able to do it over the telephone virtually. Um, but to your point, to your question, which is a really excellent one, we have really terrific uh, assessments and um, scales and measures where we can pretty much narrow down to a very uh, close um, determination of what kind of dementia the person has. And a lot of times it's a mix. It's not just one or the other, you know, you have, uh, a couple of dementia going on there. You know, my mother had all a uh, mix of Alzheimer's and vascular dementia. Um, so 
uh, you know, based on our symptoms. So um, it's, it's just really important that you have a professional evaluate that person. Is the diagnosis know. different for the three types of dementia? Dementia that you mentioned? Uh, the, say the that again, Is the prognosis different? Um, yes. The outcome oh, different? yes. Yeah, there are certain medications you would get for Lewy body, for example, mm -hmm. just hallucinations, disturbances, um, gait disturbances uh, that you would not want to give with Alzheimer's because it can exacerbate their symptoms. Mm -hmm. so it's important. Yeah. yeah to, very interesting. So very important to get a, a, um, a checkup on that by somebody who actually knows what they're doing. Exactly. Um, I have another question here related to the diagnostic tools. So the question here is, are there other new diagnostic tools other than the pending labs for tau? So that's a great question. Um, so we have the ability now to do uh, what we call a PET scan, uh, positive emission. Um, I have a hard time with that. Um, uh, where we can, we have a good look into the brain and we can see uh, amyloid plaques. Uh, there are two things that we commonly think of with Alzheimer's disease. Uh, uh, um, amyloid plaques and, and tau tangles. They're both proteins. They're abnormally clumped uh, in the brain and they're not a good thing. Um, we, can, we can see this on a PET scan. Um, and the problem with that is uh, it's expensive. So, you know, uh, insurance now pays a lot of times for a PET scan if you're showing symptoms, um, especially if you're younger, uh, that's a real concern. They'll often pay for that. You can get into studies that get the PET scan, um, you know, but uh, so that's one thing. Uh, you know, we, uh, earlier this year in January, there was a big consortium. Uh, I was in attendance um, as, a, as a student. Uh, to uh, where the National Institute of Aging has come up with an algorithm based on your symptoms and your blood work, you know, looking at the, uh, the amyloid. Uh, they, you can't measure amyloid in the blood, it's trickier. Uh, so they tend to focus on the plasma uh, tau protein and then imaging, and they can pretty well make a definitive diagnosis from that. We used to say that you couldn't diagnose Alzheimer's disease until you were dead because you had to cut open the brain to be able to look to see if it was the amyloid or um, tau that was in the brain causing the issue. But now we're getting beyond that. And again, there's so many resources being poured into this um, that I feel eventually we're going to even ha have an easier, even easier way to diagnose. But this blood test will go a long way toward that. Yeah, great. Um, I'm switching gears a little bit and talking about a diversity. Do you find that race becomes a factor in the type of medical treatments and accessible medical help in older seniors? Well, I'll tell you, that's such a powerful point that, that, that uh, was raised. Um, definitely people medically diverse get less treatment. I mean, it's just, you know, that is one of the disparities. Um, and it's a good case in point out in Belle Glade. You know, if people want to get treated, there's nowhere to go. You know, you either have to rely on your provider uh, who may or may not be willing to try to put you on the two known, uh, best known classes of drugs. You know, you would know them as Aricept and Namenda, um, you know, because he thinks, oh, they don't work. Uh, or maybe try to get to Wellington, which is uh, 40 miles away. Uh, to, you know, to hook up with a neurologist there. Um, that's why the Memory Wellness Center here at FAU is uh, doing telehealth. So, you know, we can plug into people there. But even then, you know, you have a lot of ethnically diverse people uh, who may not have computer or computer access. So then you're trying to do this um, over the phone. As far as language, we have Haitian Creole and Spanish speakers at the Memory and Wellness Center, so that's not as much of a barrier. But for sure, ethnicity, there are so many articles that have recently come out. In fact, one came out this week showing disparity between ethnically diverse groups, not just um, detection um, and diagnosis, but also treatment for Alzheimer's and related dementias. It's a big issue. Great. 
Um, you mentioned lifestyle and lifestyle changes in your presentation. Um, is there evidence that if you were to, um, and I don't know how to test that, but if you were to change your lifestyle early on, does that slow down or even prevent uh, the prognosis of dementia or Alzheimer's? The short answer is yes. <laughs> so, um, and that's what's so beautiful. You know, this is new. You know, this has only come about in the last few years. We've we've always known that exercise, not all the time, nothing is 100%. You know, I, I have people tell me my husband exercised all his life, never smoked, ate, drank, and he still got Alzheimer's disease. You know, it's, it's not... Um, it's not a, a guarantee, but we have done studies of thousands and thousands of people and, and been able to show that um, at any point, if you, for example, let's take education. Um, we, we now know that um, e introducing education, even at an older age, will help prevent cognitive decline. And we measure that over cognitive function tests, you know, just like what I was talking about. Um, so, you know, uh, as an older adult, continuing to read the paper, uh, attend webinars like this, um, you know, uh, doing crossword puzzles, taking a class, a course, anything that's going to stimulate the firing of your neurons in your brain uh, helps uh, prevent further decline. Sleep is so important. When you sleep, you help out the plaques and tangles. Um, and again, this is fairly new research, but uh, the research done with thousands of people, uh, you know, people who have poor sleep quality have much higher incidence. And we actually have shown the progression of the clock angles in people who aren't sleeping well, because you're not getting into that REM sleep and clearing out the garbage in your brain. Um, mm -hmm. Another thing that's really important is we now know that uh, what we call um, um, childhood experiences, your life course, you know, what you experience as a, a young kid, you know, if you were experiencing psychological abuse, emotional abuse, physical abuse, sexual abuse, when you, that, that whole cohort has a much higher incidence of Alzheimer's disease. Um, and yeah. same thing with nutrition. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, it's really something, you know, yeah. we can really turn this around if we can get our country back on track with being healthier, you know? And you look at countries that have a lot less Alzheimer's disease and, and they, don't, they don't have, of course they have their own issues, but you know, they don't have a lot of the things that we have, especially in regards to nutrition, so. Very yeah. interesting. Um, very different question. Uh, this question is related to a patent by an FAU professor that uh, was just created and is a plaque blocker. And the question is if you know of it. I don't. <laughs> oh, wow. I, I would love to know of it. No. I, <laughs> but hey, I'm all for it. And I don't care who does it. So if it's FAU, that's even better. But no, I am not aware of that. I'll have to look into that. Um, coming back to sleep. Does it matter, the, the, does the sleeping pattern matter for the outcome? For example, for someone who has sufficient hours of sleep, but he sleeps during the day instead of night, or maybe in, in, in episodes, if you like, does that matter? Uh, yes, it does. So the point is, is to try to get at least three cycles of uninterrupted REM sleep. So we're talking about seven hours of uninterrupted sleep. So it does matter, it's a great question. Very interesting. Um, we are out of questions now. So I thank you, Lisa. Thank you very much for being here. Um, if you have an interest in this topic, I encourage you to come to our next week's talk because we have Dr. Maria Ardonius from our uh, Louis and Anne Memory and Wellness Center talk about what they are doing in, in the Memory and Wellness Center. And, and Dr. Wiese mentioned that multiple times in, in her discussion. So I encourage you to call in uh, next week. And thank you again, Dr. Wiese. I hope everybody has a great day. I enjoyed it. Thank you for having me.